Hi everybody. In JavaScript, we have a bunch of ways of working with objects, whether we're creating them, modifying them, extending them. There's a lot of different tips and tricks we have in our giant bag of tips and tricks to make working with them easier. Recently, JavaScript introduced yet one more way of working with objects, and that is by using the class syntax. In this video, we'll learn all about what the class syntax does and why it makes working with objects a little bit more fun than it might be without actually using them. Now, many of you who are familiar with other programming languages that are more object oriented, like Java or C Sharp or any list of other languages, you might be familiar with the terms class and classes. Now, if you don't know what they are, if you aren't familiar with other languages, don't worry about it, not a big deal. We'll learn the interesting parts that are relevant for what we're trying to do as the video progresses. In the world of JavaScript, the main thing to keep in mind is that classes are nothing special. There's a handful of new keywords and conventions that really just add a little syntactic sugar, simplification over what we had to type when working with objects using the non-class-based approaches. When we think of a class, what exactly is it? Let's start at the very, very beginning. We can think of a class as a template, a template that objects refer to when they're being created. So for example, let's say we wanna create an object whose type is going to be of planet, we're gonna create a planet object. The way we can do it by using the class syntax is by first defining the planet class, the planet template, by using the class keyword, the name of the object type, planet, and then the open bracket, close bracket, similar to like we would for functions or methods or other kinds of scenarios we want to have block scoping. So this is the most basic form of a class where we just have class and then planet. Now, to create an object based on this class, this should look a little familiar to you. We define the name of the object we want, in which case it's my planet, and then we instantiate it. We create it using whatever history of the object we want to go with, and that is by using the new keyword, and in the case of planet, by using planet, then open parenthesis, close parenthesis, to, to tell our my planet object that now it's going to be based off of whatever is defined by the planet class. And I like to always go back to this diagram. I know it's a little complicated, and I know many of you have told me that this is way too complex for what we're trying to do, but hear me out here. This visualization is very powerful because it really ties and drives home the relationship what we're creating has with the very fundamental objects that JavaScript creates behind the scenes for everything, because everything within JavaScript is represented by an object behind the scenes. It's just that how we go from where we are to getting to the object at the very end is defined by a diagram very similar to this. So what we have here is our my planet object, which you can see at the very end highlighted in orange. And notice that it has a prototype property, which it points to the prototype of the planet class that we defined earlier using the class syntax. And if you know, I abstract away a lot of the lines and details because the focus isn't to go deep into the object prototype inheritance, but you can see it all goes back to objects. So to read exactly what's on the slide here, there are three things that happen when we use a new keyword to create an object based on the planet class. Our new object, as expected, is simply of type planet. Our new object's prototype property is a new function or classes prototype. You can see that here. And the last part, which we're going to dive into a little bit more detail, is a constructor function it gets executed that deals with initializing our newly created object. Because right now our planet is empty. There's nothing inside of it. The constructor function is probably one of the more important things that our class helps define. It is responsible for initializing our newly created object, and it does so by running any code contained inside it during object creation. There's nothing special we need to do to call the constructor, it gets called automatically, which means it plays a very powerful role in helping set the stage for what the object we create will do once it has been created. So here we have the class planet, just like we had before, but now we have a function called constructor. It takes two arguments, name and radius, and I'm not doing anything fancy here. All I'm doing is just setting this.name equals the name argument and this at radius equals the radius argument. Just creating some local variables to store two values that we're going to be passing in as part of creating our planet object. And you can see how we use that by looking at a slightly expanded version of how we create my planet. We still have the my planet object defined. We're still saying new planet, but notice inside the parentheses, we pass in the two arguments that map to the constructor arguments of name and radius. We're creating a new planet called Earth, and we're giving it a radius value of 6378. And if I wanted to see this value after the fact, I can just do console.log and do my planet.name, and then we'll see the value of Earth 
being returned. So a really simple way for us to not only create an object, but give that object some unique properties that help separate it and make it more useful. Definitely not as useful as it can be, but more useful than it was in the initial state where all we have is just class planet. So we'll make it more interesting as time goes on. And again, to go back to this diagram, you can now see that our my planet object has the name and radius properties specified in as a result of what we did. And then everything else again just goes back to normal to kind of indicate that these values are local to the my planet object itself. Like not every planet has the value of name and radius, only the my planet object that we created has it, which is an important detail as part of creating many, many objects and make sure each object has its own unique set of values that set it apart from other objects you may have created. So right now, what we've done is nothing special. Everything I've shown you, we could have done using object.create in the, what I might call the old world. And so take a look at how this would look. You, know, you have function, my function planet, name radius, same value specified, and the way we create it again looks exactly identical. And the output of this approach would be the same as the diagram I showed earlier. Now here's where we're gonna start diverging a bit. Up till now, yes, what we've seen in the class syntax is nothing really too great to write home about. But what we're gonna be seeing from here on out though, you'll see how the class syntax kind of simplifies and abstracts away from the details we would have had to more, I guess, more in a more hands-on way handle using just the traditional object methods. So our class objects look like functions. We kind of saw that, but they have some quirks. And one of the big quirks is that what goes into the body of our class is this special constructor function. But the other things that go inside the class are other functional methods, getters, and setters. We have a different video you may have seen already on getters and setters on this channel. I'll link to it in the description later if you want to refresher on what that is. But the important thing is, outside of functions and methods and getters and setters, there's nothing else that can live in our class syntax. No variable declarations, initializ initializations, none of that is allowed. Our class syntax is very, very particular about what exactly lives inside of it. And so here's an example now where I'm extending the class planet by one more method. I'm adding this method called get surface area. And you can see that what I'm specifying here is a variable called surface area. I'm doing some multiplication using the traditional you know, formula for getting surface area of a spherical object, which is four pi r square. And notice that the value for radius in this case is using this dot radius, which has already been set by using by, by our constructor when creating the planet object. And we're returning the value of surface area when this method gets called. And you can see that when I create my object, as I said before, I can now call earth like a surface area and the value will be returned. It'll be some really large number. I don't have it memorized off the top of my head, but you know you can run this code on your own and figure out what it might be. Now let's go even further. Let's go ahead and add some setters and getters to make getting the value of some of these areas a little bit more straightforward. And so what I'm doing now is I'm creating my object just like before, but instead I'm also setting the gravity property directly. And I'm saying that gravity equals 9.81. And no, call it Earth get surface area again, which I don't really need to, I'm not sure why I have it here, but I can print out the value of alert earth.gravity and get 9.81 back. And that is a result of both the getters and setters that have now been defined as part of our class. So if you can see the evolution of how our syntax has evolved a bit, our class when we saw maybe a few moments ago was empty. All we had was class planet. Then we added the constructor, we added some arguments, we added some local variables, and now we have some methods and some getters and setters. We now have the essentially the full range of the types of things we can have inside a class defined this very simple compact example. And if we look at the, how this looks, notice that what we have for the Earth object in this case is the local variables name, radius, and underscore gravity, which matches the getter and setter that we have. But the important part is the methods that we added, the getters and setters and the constructor, notice where they live. They don't live on Earth. They live in the more shared planet that prototype object, which means that we saw when, as part of extending an object, we want to extend the prototype to avoid all of these from being duplicated with every object that we have. Like we wouldn't want to have every planet having its own copy of get surface area or gravity. But by using the class syntax, it's automatically taken care of for us. There's no explicit extending to array that prototype or building an array that prototype that we need to do with it. So our planet prototype automatically gets these values, which is a, again, slightly more 
you know, advanced detail to keep in mind, but it's good to know that the right thing happens behind the scenes, even though what you're doing is what seems like a very simple, straightforward thing of just adding more things to our object so that our object can have more capabilities. So speaking of extending objects, the next big thing that classes help with, and this is where they really, really make your life easier, is in how you can take an object and extend it with more capabilities. So imagine, for example, we, we had planets, you know, which is what we started off with, but let's say I want to create a more specialized version of a planet. Let's say I want to create the potato planet, a planet that is not made up of you know, rocks and molten lava and just stuff like carbon-based things that we have on Earth today, but different type of carbon-based things, in which case we have more potato-centric content. By the way, there's no such thing as a potato planet as far as we know, but just work with me here. You know, this is a, a simple way of highlighting how we can extend a planet to do interesting things. And the way we're going to extend it is by we're going to add some arguments like a potato type and then we'll have a get potato type method that points to the console the, that or prints to the console the value of potato type, a very simple way of doing this. Now, there are several ways of doing this. The wrong way, the way you don't want to do it, is in the way I've shown on screen right here. Notice that we have a class called potato planet. So far, so good. There's the potato type argument and you know, little things like that going on here. We modify get potato type and things are going on. But the part that is wrong about this is that if we had a side-by-side -side comparison of the planet class and what we have here with the potato planet, you'll see a lot of duplicate code. What we are seeing here is I, I copied and pasted the planet class definitions and all the things inside of it and made some modifications here and there. And typically, you don't want to do copy and pasting. You want to do something that is more, I guess, maintainable, and that is the, the premise behind the idea of extending an object. So what we really want to do is something like this. We still have our class planet as it was defined earlier. Nothing has changed over there. What we're doing though is extending it. And notice how we have the syntax for extending it defined here. You can see that it is a slightly subtle variation of what the original planet looks like. And I'm gonna focus on just this syntax to make it a little easier for you to see on screen. Here we have class potato planet. And instead of just ending the declaration right there, I'm using the extends keyword and specifying the object that we're extending, in which case it is planet. And notice that our constructor it has another definition in it. It's name, width, and like I described as part of the requirements for potato planet, we want to define a potato type on it as well. And so our constructor now takes three arguments instead of two. Now here's where the, the real kicker comes into place. Notice this keyword called super on the name and width. What super name and width does is it says for whatever the parent of this class is, which case is planet, call the constructor on it and pass these arguments into it. Which means that when I'm creating a potato planet, the name and width are created using the planet syntax or planet objects constructor and whatever is supposed to be done behind the scenes. And what's unique to this particular object is potato type. So I have that specified separately. So you always want to call super, which is a way of calling the parent and using the logic you've already created as part of what you are extending from as opposed to recreating all that again. Because again, recreating duplication, not a good thing. And then I have get potato type, which is again, unique to potato planet that does its own special behavior for printing the value of the planet that we are currently creating. And so the one thing of the constructor to keep in mind is that the find the constructor is optional. If I did not make any modifications to the constructor, and I'm just going to leave it as whatever potato had it, which is really name and radius, I can just skip using the potato planet, I mean, using the constructor altogether. You just have class potato planet, extends planet, have my own method called say hello, and just go on with my life. So remember that if you see examples of code that either you're writing or you've seen on the web where there's no constructor there, they're not wrong, it's not a bad example. It just means that the constructor has already been defined by the parent is perfectly valid for what you're trying to do in your own more specialized type of object. But here, like I mentioned earlier, we are doing some modification. We're doing something special. We're modifying the constructor to take into account potato type, but we're using super to make sure that we're calling the constructor on the parent for the things that are not going to be changing, like name and width. And so if I were to use this example and see how it all works, you can see that I've created a new object called Spudnik. See, funny, right? Instead of Spudnik, it's Spudnik. Yeah, you know, you can unsubscribe if you found that to be absolutely terrible. And I'm creating a new object called new potato planet, name, radius, and in this case, the type of potato, which is a new argument for it. And if I were to type in Sputnik that get potato type, the word russet will be printed on screen. 
kind of exactly what you would have expected. Now, here's where, the, again, going back to visualization, things go a little bit more hairy, but you can still see if you follow along like what's going on here, we have an object called Spudnik, and it is based off of Potato Planet, which is what we are creating. But notice the constructor for Potato, for the on Potato Planet goes into Potato Planet, and then from there the prototype, the planet, goes in right below it, which kind of helps explain how calling super and how calling our own particular version of the constructor kind of plays in with this overall world. But as always, all roads lead to the object at prototype. So you can see that we have potato planet, that which then goes into planet and planet prototype, an object at pro in a prototype. So that's the overall hierarchy if it had followed the follow the parent-child relationship to get to where your object is ultimately going to go, it always goes through that particular angle. So nothing too fancy there. So there we have it, a very quick overview of how classes are used in JavaScript to simplify a lot of the object-related work that we've been doing in the past more, more manually. You can, exam you can imagine a world where instead of extending an object by explicitly defining the prototype or being very conscious about will a variable be shared across all instances or will it be unique to a particular instance, all those details are now kind of hidden away behind this really nice simplified syntax that our class and classes and extends and constructor and all these new set of things we just saw in this video bring to the table. And if you already have a background in other programming languages where the class syntax is pretty much the default way you use it to create objects, all these things we've seen so far should be very, very familiar to you. And so with that, we'll continue looking at some other topics in subsequent videos. But for now, if you have any questions, post in the forums at formnetgroup.com. A lot of people there like objects, like JavaScript, like the whole world of what goes on behind the scenes there. So you'll be able to interact with other really smart people and get help very, very quickly. So post in the forums at formnetgroup.com. If you like this video, tell your friends and enemies all about it. Hit subscribe to be notified of new videos. Follow me at Krupa on Twitter, on Facebook, and other places that you might find my name. And if you like to watch videos, but you also might prefer reading things in a more, more physical kind of a book form, guess what? I have books written for a lot of the topics you might see a video of. This particular topic is currently available in our JavaScript Absolute Beginner's Guide published by Pearson under the Q subprint. So take a look at that book, highly rated, people like it a lot. Give it a shot. It's available in paperback and Kindle editions. And with that, I will see you all next time.